Cody, you ready, brother? Sure. Let's rock it. Let's do this, brother. Everybody give a round of applause for Cody. <laughs> Cody is our newest uh, billionaire boardroom member. Um, I know he's got a presentation here, but I just want to say that Cody came out to see me probably two months ago, something like that. Sure. Yeah. Flew out from Phoenix to sit down with me once he showed me what this guy is doing. Um, he kind of blew my mind in a really big way. Um, and very quickly, I was like, bro, you got to be, you got to get in here. You got to share this. This is some gangster shit that this guy's doing right here. Um, again, just walked in the door. And the next thing you know, he's a part of Billionaire Boardroom because he, he is a big ass deal doing very, very big things, very big projects that I think will be very eye opening for everybody in here about what is actually possible. So let's rock it, bro. Thanks, buddy. Well, hey, thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to be completely transparent with you. This is the first time ever I've done a PowerPoint presentation. I've done, <laughs> I've done lots of podcasts and talk about what I do over the last couple of years um, when I started my educational company, Vestrite. And uh, you know, I'm, what I'm trying to accomplish is right here at this point in my career, which is PIF, which is Purpose, Impact, Fulfillment. Um, through my purpose, I can have an impact. And through that impact, I can find true fulfillment. I actually don't believe in the word happiness. I think what we're all searching for is what's called fulfillment. And I don't think fulfillment's possible without having impact. So that's part of the reason why I'm here today is this, this is me living out my purpose and making, having an impact on others. We had a student comment just yesterday on one of our posts talking about, um, it almost brought me to tears, but just talking about our course, our content, our team, how we've dramatically changed his life forever. And just, I mean, you, you can't beat receiving feedback like that. So that's the purpose. That's why I'm here today. And uh, anyways, just appreciate you having me. Um, so my company's Allied Development. And uh, who are we? Um, we specialize. Well, let me ask you this. How many in here do off-market deals? OK, this is why this is the perfect room for me to be speaking to. Because the only thing I do is off-market. You bring me an on-market deal, I don't even look at it. But I'm also not a house wholesaler, and I heard some great stories today of why online you know, listed deals work well, can work well for house wholesaling or for some other single-family models. But in my model, you bring me an online deal, and more than likely, I'm, I'm not going to give it the time of day. So I do strictly off-market deals, and it's all raw land, and not rural land like there's a guy out there called the land guy or something that does rural land and he flips it, wholesales it and makes whatever, 10, 20 grand a deal. All of my deals are all raw land that have development potential, okay? That I can go and develop it into a single family neighborhood. So to give you an idea, my clients are publicly traded companies like DR Horton, Lennar, whoever, okay? Because they got to feed their home building machine. They got to keep that company going. So they're dying to do business with a guy like me because I'm the one putting the deals together. At the end of the day, whoever controls the dirt controls the deal, period. So because I control the dirt, I call the shots. I decide what happens. Every house you guys are buying and flipping or wholesaling, it all started with the dirt, right? Everything starts with the dirt. And I, someone mentioned earlier about, oh, you, you, you were talking about with those deals you, you have under contract. You said, you said, I have the contract, so I control the deal. Similar idea, right? I, I control the dirt, so I control the deal. Um, so anyways, we specialize in, in off-market raw land that has development potential. Our history is I started doing this in 2002, so I'm getting ready to celebrate 20 years. And uh, I kind of stumbled into it. I was in the subcontracting industry prior to that, and I just got to know a lot of these home builders because I was servicing them as my accounts. And one thing led to another, and I decided to get really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And, and jump off that cliff. And I, and I went for self-employment. And thank the Lord, um, I've, I've never looked back. And uh, so I've been doing it. And, and I experienced the downturn in 2007 is when I got my ass absolutely whooped. Um, and here again, in, this, in the spirit of this room, and I, I'm sure Kent would vouch for this, is I'm assuming it's just complete transparency. So there's things I'm going to say today that I wouldn't say out in the public. Right, because I'd come across as an egotistical asshole, or or whatever it may be, right? Or I'd come across like if you if I start talking about piff, I might get all emotional, and I, I don't do that much in public either. So, um, but 
as far as my history, you know, I was in my mid-20s worth $20 million uh, with this exact model, and I did that over the course of five years. Um, but then, you know, I was a snot-nosed punk kid. In all reality, I thought I was smarter than everybody. I wasn't in rooms like this. I didn't have mentors. I didn't, wasn't in masterminds. I wasn't doing courses. I wasn't reading books. I just, I thought I was the stuff, right, because of my net worth. Well, a lot of that came down to right timing, right? I mean, it, the market was phenomenal during those times and connected with a few of the right people, and, and the rest is history. But in 2007, I lost 90% of my net worth. So I went from 20 million to 2 million. And I can tell you this, I learned a hell of a lot more losing that 18 million than I did making the 20. Um, and forever since then, um, my outlook on money and why we're all doing this has dramatically changed. So um, our ideal project is today, and I'll get into it in a moment, but today we're in the process of scaling across the country. Um, so we're doing projects basically where people are migrating to. There's more migration happening right now in this country than ever. right? So. You're not gonna catch me on the West Coast, I can tell you that. I was born and raised in the Portland Metro, uh, and I just moved to Scottsdale, Arizona a year ago. And so I'm still gonna do deals up in the Pacific Northwest in Oregon and Washington just because I have a 20-year pipeline there and 30,000 properties in my database, but we're not loading any new deals into our system in the Pacific Northwest. And through moving to Scottsdale and through getting exposed to other markets of the country, I realize some areas of the country actually appreciate developers. So we're getting ready, to, we're doing a 300 lot deal right now in Huntsville, Alabama, and that jurisdiction is thanking us for coming to their city and for creating neighborhoods for people to move into. And I can tell you that doesn't happen in California or Oregon or Washington. I mean, developers are the devil. So, um, but anyways, we're looking for deals that are 10 to 200 acres okay, that I can do somewhere between 50 and 1,000 residential lots. So um, that's our ideal product type. Don't get me wrong, back in the day, we did projects much smaller than that. But at this point in us scaling and where we're at as a company, we really won't look at deals that we can do less than 50 lots on. So um, our executive team, apologize for the formatting somehow when this file got transferred over to his computer, the formatting got off. We, we, um, we are more attentive to detail than what that looks like. Uh, so our team is much larger than just me and my CEO, but the reason I'm sharing this slide specifically is, is my biggest takeaway from 2020. My biggest takeaway in 2020 is, is that I realized through lots of soul searching, through masterminds, through you know, forums and different groups I'm a part of, I finally had to humble myself to realize that the biggest thing that was holding my company back was me, okay? And that my company's identity was me and my identity was my company. And so through a long process, it took me about seven months, uh, yeah, seven, eight months, and like a 10-step interviewing process, and through headhunters and whatnot, I found a CEO, okay? And his name's Scott, and Scott's been an executive the most of his career. The biggest thing I realize why I need to get out of the way is because I'm the furthest thing from an executive. I'm just a dirt guy that has a vision, right? I, I know that sounds, I'm simplifying and I'm much more than that, but my point is I'm not an executive nor do I have any desire to be an executive. So the best thing for my company, Allied, is to say, okay, I need to do what's best for the Allied brand, what's best for that company, and pull my identity out of it. And then that's where you brought on Scott. Scott is not cheap but he's worth every penny. I can tell you he started in February, February 1st of this year, and my company's already about four times bigger than it's ever been in the 20 years, okay? Just in a, he's been there, what, seven months? Just in that seven months. And here's the thing is, most everything we're doing, they're all my ideas, right? But the thing is, is that I never implemented any of them because I'm not an integrator. I hate implementing. I'm, I, I want nothing to do with it. And so I'd rather go you know, play in the pool with my daughter or, or whatever, right? Go play golf. Or, but I just, I needed that executive there that I could take everything that was going on in my head and they would make it happen. And I know you guys were speaking earlier through your partnership, you do that. Um, and for the longest time, um, I always knew, um, well, I thought I knew my weaknesses. I never believed I was a visionary until numerous guys in my life finally challenged me a few years ago 
that I actually was a visionary. I need to exercise that muscle. But I was always searching for a partner that was the visionary, right? I spent years looking for a partner that was visionary. You could never find someone that, to partner up with. Did a couple beta tests, few partnerships that didn't work out. But, um, so, but then I finally have figured out that I am a visionary through my CEO. I've now stepped out of the way. He's running the company. And it's allowed me to, to be here today, right? Do PIF. I will say I do still hold a role in the company where I'm the director of sales because uh, I'm the one that has the relationships with DR Horton and Lennar and all these large public companies. And it's going to take a while to get me out of that role. So I'm still the one that handles all of our disposition, sells all of our deals. Um, okay, what we do. What we do is, I talked about a moment ago, we do off-market raw land deals um, that have development potential. And please know that I'll do questions at the end, so just get, let me get through this presentation and I'll answer any and all questions. That's where the magic happens after I'm done presenting these things. So uh, what we specialize is, um, you know, back in the day we used to find the off-market deals. We would take them through the approval, the governmental approval process. Some of you heard the word entitlements. How many here have taken a raw land deal through entitlements? So yeah, here again, I'm speaking to the perfect crowd because only two people raised their hands. So we got a bunch of people that do off-market deals, but only two that have done entitlements. And so you're, you're going to be blown away about the opportunity. Um, so anyways, back in the day, we would find the deal, take it through the entitlement, the governmental approval process. We would develop it. We would then sell the finished lots to ourselves, and we would build the homes. Okay, that, that's what we used to do. And that's also what whooped my ass in 2007. Because when the market turned, I was stuck with hundreds of lots under construction. And one thing you can't do is rent out a vacant lot, right? And so now with today's market, there's the big, the big wave of build for rent, right? So now I got all these build for rent guys calling me, trying to buy my projects instead of me selling them to the publics because they want to build single family houses and keep them and rent them all out. And so that is a potential exit strategy if we ever got caught with the project again. But, um, to then what happened is I got burnt out of building houses. I got built out, burnt out on the mentality of subcontractors. I used to be one of them, so I have a right to say that. Um, and, uh, and so we were just, we quit building homes. We wanted to simplify our lives. And, and home building was definitely the most complicated portion of our business. So then we just started selling the finished lots to the publicly trade, traded companies. Well then, as of the last few years, we all know what's happened in the last few years. My industry, we're printing money, right? And we can't build homes quick enough. So the publicly traded companies are now more and more of them are doing what's called self-development. So they will buy the project from me at entitlements, okay, or at approval, let's say. And then they will self-develop it. They'll develop it themselves to have the lots to build on. And what's working out wonderful for, for us, guys that do what we do, is we're able to take the majority of the profit that we used to make developing the project and we're able to take it all at entitlements, okay? So, um, so that's a little bit about what we do, our company, um, how we work. Okay, so here's a traditional land development process. And this is specifically off market, okay? You go and you find a developable raw land with a willing seller. You negotiate, execute the, the land purchase agreement. Then you take it to the land use approval process, which by the way, that's just a simple little box there. It's, it's not a simple process. Um, but it's a very fruitful process. And this is why I say, I'm gonna stop right here. Some people call us, they call us wholesalers. And we, to be frank, we are not wholesalers. What we are is we're in the value add industry, okay, or a model, right? So you all have heard of value add with syndicators and they go buy apartments, they do a value add play, whether it's decreased vacancy, increased rents, you know, refurbish the property, whatever it is they're doing to get the, to get the NOI up on that property, right? Decrease costs. And that's a value add model to then increases the value of the property. I'm sure the majority of y'all know what that means. So we're in the value add model. That's what we do because we're taking a piece of raw land that all it is is a farmland or whatever it is, and we're taking it through this approval process to get it to now be, become an, an approved subdivision, right? An approved development. So that's, that's why it's value add. Um, so anyways, you get the land use approval. Then you got to go and get your construction drawings approved. Here again, the slides are a little off, but that says close on land purchase. I want to make sure you guys make a note of that. Close on land purchase. If you want me to pay for a diamond, I got to make sure it's a diamond. And it's not a diamond until it's approved, okay? Period, period. Please, don't ever, I don't want to hear a story that you, 
put in paid premium development values and you close without approvals, that's complete stupidity. Okay? And if I hurt anybody's feelings, I'm sorry, but it's complete stupidity. The only way I will close on a piece of land and pay development values, well, I won't. The only way I'll close on land prior to it being approved is if I'm buying it as is value. Because then my land bank division will buy the property. Okay? And what we'll do is we'll go and we'll buy it as farmland, we'll put it in our land bank, we'll go get the approvals, and then we, we gained all that additional upside. But there's no way I'm going to pay development values unless it's approved. Okay? So I close on the land, go and uh, get my A&D loan, acquisition and development loan, put up in a crazy amount of capital, and then I go and I build it, right? And then I sell the finished lots to a home builder, and then I get paid, okay? That's a traditional cycle of what happens, okay? And that cycle there, you know, could be, could be two years to five years, right? I mean, some, actually, there's some jurisdictions we're getting to now in the country where I might actually be able to get through that whole thing in like 18 months, but um, I'm not used to that coming from the Pacific Northwest. Um, okay, so here's our shortcut process. Same thing, you go and find the developable land, you negotiate the contract, you take it through approvals, but then I put construction drawings and horizontal construction in red because you're gonna avoid that process, okay? And guess what, you should, if you can, especially in this market, this is what I'm doing and I'm still making all the profits I would if I would go and get the construction drawings approved, develop the project, and then sell it. Because these guys want the lot so bad, right? They could care less if they make a penny on it developing it, okay? The guy said to me just the other day, he said, Cody, we look at development just like a two by four. It's just a cost of home building, right? So, which is really fun right now that guys are looking at it that way. So, so here's what you avoid by doing that. Sorry, here again, the sled's cut off. Avoid, you avoid nine to 20 months of the process. You avoid majority of the risk. Majority of the risk is once you, is once you, you break ground, okay? And you took out that A and D loan and you put up, you know, however many millions of capital. We could get into those calculations if you guys care. And then, and then you're in the middle of developing the subdivision in the market turns, okay? You, 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 um, you have a lot of risk exposure there. Now I do, th I just, just for the record, I think we have a, a nice run ahead of us. I think COVID um, wiped out the normal downturn we would see. And so I think, you know, I'm, I'm more in now than I ever been in my whole career. I just, I, I'm not gonna be one that is timid and I got several buddies that are timid right, right now. And, um, you know, Lord willing, you know, but if, if what plays out, what I think is gonna be play out, those guys are gonna be whining on the sidelines. Um, as we're continuing to print money, and then we're stepping away and doing our big exit. So uh, let's see, avoid major capital needed because you got to put up substantial capital at the time of closing on the land and putting in, the, in and getting the A&D loan. You avoid the debt of the A&D loan and you avoid the market exposure. So you'll see what I did here is originally I had that I, I had close on the purchase over here at construction drawings. Well, now I have close at purchase down here when I'm selling it to the builder, okay? And so, because what I'm doing is a double closing or a simultaneous close. So what it's happening is, is that I'm gonna own the property for a split second. Because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use DR Horton's money to pay my seller, and I'm gonna take my scrape out of the middle, okay? And so, it, but it does take capital, don't get me wrong. You, you got it, because all those approvals, all that land use approval and earnest money, that costs money, right? Um, can I catch a question at the end? Thanks. Um, and so, so then I sell it to the builder and I get paid, okay? So here's, and then here's a, another model we're doing right now with our students. It's called our prospecting partner process. Um, I guess that's not very really fancy, but all they do is they go and they find the developable raw land with a willing seller off market, right? One of you come across a land deal. You don't know two shits about what to do with a land deal that's developable. And maybe you have no desire to learn it. Well, you just tee it up, you bring it to us, and if you just want a quick payday, like, like you wouldn't wholesaling or whatever, then I'll just write you a quick check and you can go on your merry way. Now, if you're willing to hold in the process with me, so I'll negotiate the contract, you know, because it's price and terms and there's a lot to understand. I will run it through the land use process. I will get it sold, okay, and then I get paid. And I will capitalize all that and my team will run it all. But, uh, and then what happens is your paydays, there's only $3 signs, but your payday is going to be about 10x what it would have if you just wanted the quick payday, okay? So if you, if you allow me to pay you when I get paid, 
you're going to make about 10x what you would if you just wanted to quick check. Okay? So that's, that's what we call our prospecting part of the process. In that situation, you avoid the entire process because you're, what you're doing is just teeing it up and then calling my team. You're avoiding all the risk. You're avoiding all the capital needing. You're avoiding the debt. You're avoid, avoiding the market exposure. Um, okay, so here's a, here's a partner case study. So this is one of my graduate students. He brought me a deal. Um, in, this is in Cedar Hill, Texas. I know there's some guys back there that, are, that uh, Neil know Cedar Hill. By the way, Cedar Hill, nothing impressive about it, is there, right? <coughs> no, no. But my, my, my student that brought me the deal is going to make $551,000 on that deal, okay? And that deal, that deal is set to close here um, pretty quick. So um, what he did is he teed the deal up, brought it to us. We handled the whole process. I just sold the deal for $7.5 million to one of the publicly traded companies, and my student's cut of the profit will be $551,000. So, so um, this is a good time to bring it up. You know, I love the house wholesaling model. I mean, I have no desire to do it, but I, I, see, I see where there's money to be made. But, it, you know, this is an option for something that you can bolt onto that, right? If you're already hunting off market deals, this is a consideration of something that you don't need to go learn the whole process that I do if you don't want to. But why not, when you come across a land deal, why not be in a position to get a check for $551,000? So I'm not trying to come here and say, hey, you should give up wholesaling, or you should give up fix and flips, or you should give up this. I'm saying, one of the first questions I ask is, who in here does off-market deals? And basically, everybody raised their hand. Well, that means this is a perfect bolt-on to what you're already doing, okay? And here's the reality, you guys are probably better at off-market prospecting than I am, right? So you're, you might even be more effective than we are. So, so anyways, yeah, seven and a half million sold to a public, partners making 551,000. Um, finding developable raw land, and this is where I think you guys will probably actually be able to educate me, but I'll, I'll be up here telling you at least what we do do. Um, so first of all, well, you want to educate me on this process. Um, so five concepts you must know to determine if a land is developable or not. First thing is you need to understand the zoning of the land, right? What's it zoned for? And it might, be, it might have the wrong zoning, but some jurisdictions are, in the process, are, are open to the idea of rezoning properties. Like that deal I was told you were doing in Huntsville, like we're buying like 80 acres, it's 300 and some odd deal, uh, probably sell it to DR Horton. Um, and that deal is actually zoned commercial, but Huntsville is exploding, and, and we're doing a rezone from commercial to residential. But you've got to understand zoning. You know, I have friends who will call me once in a while and say, oh, you know, Cody, I just drove by this great piece of property and it would be perfect for development. Well, the reality is there's no utility. It's, it's zoned ag. It's not even remotely developable. Utilities are 10 miles away. You know, it's got a wetland overlay on it and, and the topography, you know, whatever. Like, there's, you've got to understand these things. So you've got to understand zoning. You've got to understand access. How is that piece of property going to be accessed? in order to become a neighborhood, right? Next is utilities. Is there public sewer nearby? It doesn't have to be right at the property. I mean, we love it when it is, but often we might have to run the utilities, you know, 1,500 feet or whatever. We call those off-sites. So those are additional costs above and beyond my costs on the actual, my land itself. But the utilities, are they nearby or at the property? And so that'd be sanitary sewer, public water, right? Ele electric. Um, some jurisdictions, it's, there's also storm water, right? So for, for storms, um, is there the overlays on the property? Is there any like natural habitat overlays on the property? And this is all easy stuff to find out. You just got to know where to look. But is there any, you know, is there wetlands on it? Is there a floodplain on it? Is there steep slopes overlay on it? Like what overlays are on the property that allow you to not develop portion of the property or maybe even all of it? Um, next is the topography. Right, so um, certain pieces, if they're, say they're extremely steep, they might have a steep overlay on them where you can't even develop them. Or we'll develop hillsides all day long. I've de developed a gazillion hillsides, but understand the costs on that deal are gonna be much different than if I'm developing a flat piece of property. So those are just five basic concepts to, 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 to think through or get educated on as far as can a piece be developed or not. Um, next is, uh, how to find off-market developable raw land. Um, so it's scanning zoning maps, farming with the title companies. I'll get into the details of those two in a minute. 
scanning aerials on Google satellite view, follow projects in action by other developers, newsletter city meetings. Because um, most city meetings and whatnot are, 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 are public. So here's the here, first one, scanning zoning maps. Okay, so let's just say that on the left there, that, that particular color is maybe R5, right? Which is residential 5,000 square foot lots. So, but then you go over here to the aerial, and this deal's probably a no-go, because still to this day, I've never bought a school, right? So a deal, you know, and I'm not saying it's not possible. I have friends that have bought schools, but I've never bought a school, so more than likely that's a no-go. So let's go to another illustration. This one's a maybe, same zoning, R5, great piece, come here and it's a church. You might think it's a no-go and it's actually not. I, I think I've bought property from, I don't know, five or six churches at this point. Um, and so churches are, are worth calling, no questions asked. Um, then here's obviously a, a, a great fit, a good find, right? So this is just a, a residential home. They got this big piece of property and, and that's a sweet find, right? So uh, next is farming with the title companies. Um, so many of the title companies is, and we've done it this way for 20 years and it's, it's amazing how many people didn't even know this was possible, is we will get a hold of our title company, right? Their builder developer services department. And we will say, okay, we are looking to find all properties in this boundary, okay? That is say 10 acres or more zoned this, right? And it's, that's all the criteria we give them, those two criteria, right? Size and zoning. They send us over all the data that, that meets that criteria in a CSV file. We load that up into our CRM. Our mailers go out and our cold callers start calling. Okay? And um, that's been our most effective way to obtain the data. And then cold calling, hands down, has been our most effective way of getting deals done. And follow-up has been brought up many, many times already today. Kent just spoke about it a moment ago. I have had people call, I have properties right now that I've been following up with for almost 20 years that haven't sold me yet. I have other properties where I followed up with them for five to 10 years, okay? And they call us when they're ready to sell and they're like, hey, Allied, you've been following up with us for five freaking years. Like we figure we better give you first shot at this deal because we're finally ready to sell. And I've bought numerous deals that way. I absolutely believe in building a, a solid business model, all of your money is made in follow through and follow up. To me, that is a legit, that, well, it's signs of you being a legit business. If it's just a one off, it's always one offs, you're, you're, never filling your, you're never filling the funnel. The goal is to fill the funnel, right? And the way you keep the funnel full is through follow up and follow through. So um, I, I could be a broken record on that. So, so yeah, so we define the area, we set the criteria, uh, and they, then and it says the word often, because not always, um, they provide us the data, and usually we get them to do it for free, okay? Um, so next is uh, proper, uh, property owners, sellers, being a part of their legacy. Okay, this is very important to me. You'll hear me say two, you'll hear me talk about PIF a lot, and you'll hear me talk about legacy a lot. And, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go off on a tangent in just one second. I wasn't always that way, okay? I got my high school girlfriend pregnant. I have a 24 year old son, I'm 43. I married her right after high school, she was pregnant. And I have a 24 year old son and a, and a 20 year old daughter, okay? And I can tell you that I failed miserably. Well, Cody, you, you were 28, 20 million. I failed fucking miserably because I was a workaholic, okay? My kids didn't know me. I was gone before they woke up and I got home after they went to bed. And so to me, success isn't defined by dollars. Success is defined by, let's talk about all the pillars of life. Let's talk about your spiritual life. Let's talk about your health. Let's talk about your relationships. Let's talk about your business. Let's talk about, right, your impact. You're giving back. You're making, like, you gotta be able to succeed in all those areas in order to be truly successful in my definition, in my eyes, okay? And so part of that, is PIF, Purpose Impact Fulfillment, which leads me to legacy, is um, we look at property owners, is, and especially in our space, a lot of these properties have been in the family for decades, 
right? It's a legacy property. The last thing I want to do is try to go in there and rip that property from that family legacy, right? I don't want to be that guy. So, but beautiful thing of our model is you don't have to go in there and try to find desperate sellers or motivated sellers or try to rip them to make a quick fee. It's not at all the case in our model, okay? Our model, we make money because remember, value add. We're taking a piece of raw land and we're taking it through the approval process and we're getting it approved and then we're selling it. And so, the, like DR Horton, Lennar, any of these publics, they hate the entitlement process, okay? Because it doesn't fit inside their pretty little box. There's moving parts and you gotta be somewhat of a chameleon, you gotta be creative. And, and so we often feel like we're like a facilitator or almost like a moderator, a chameleon, because we can go and do special things for property owners that those pub, public companies could never do, okay? So we just play that middle man, we bring value. The, you know, the process we go through on average takes six months to a year, and so it, you, they can take that six months to a year out of their time value money calculation. The public companies can. So anyway, so. Uh, no, no, no need to find motivated or desperate sellers. We pay fair market value, no hardball negotiation. Plus, very few people know my space, right? So uh, I think as you all know. And so th there's not a line at the door of people trying to buy this off market deal. Um, I, don't, our, our, I don't even know what that says up there, but uh, uh, let's just keep going. Uh, where, where we're at now. So. Uh, to give you an idea of our model and how excited we are, um, with hiring the CEO, Scott, he's based out of Dallas, Texas. Like I mentioned ago, I'm in Scottsdale. And so we just opened our headquarters in Dallas, Texas. That's where our company's now based out of. Staff relocated, and we're in the process of scaling. We're trying to hire. We have about 30 positions we're trying to hire for right now. Um, finally, when Cody got out of the way, because he's not an executive, now the business is blowing up. So to give you an idea, about a month ago, I did a live webinar with 172 people on it, and I got five minutes, they made me aware. Uh, so we raised eight figures in our allied land fund in three and a half hours, okay? And so, so we, we generated a bunch of capital, so we're in the process of scaling across the country. We're, in, we're doing deals in Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Texas, Arizona, Boise, Pacific Northwest, because I have to. Um, and, uh, but basically, anywhere people are migrating to, I want to do deals. And so um, we have relationships with all the national home builders. CEO is running the development company now, which allows me, frees me up to focus more on PIF, which is why I'm here today. Um, uh, what we need, we need developable raw land ranging from 10 to 200 acres. Uh, we need developable raw land across the country. We need it to fit our development criteria. And then we need, quote, quote, dirt dogs to be actively bringing us deals, helping us prospect. Um, uh, if you want to learn more, so if, whether you want, to, you want to learn how to put these, you know, find these deals and tee them up for us, or whether you want to come do what I do, I just want to be a part of your life. I want to have an impact on your life. So if you, we have m tons of students that are doing what we do, go to vestright.com slash boardroom. Uh, here's a little bit about Vestright and our training. But at the end of the day, go to Vestright, um, the boardroom, and then um, PIF. Uh, it's not all about us. Fifth, purpose, impact, fulfillment. Our mission is to share so that we together can create fulfilling legacies through our purpose and impact. And the last thing was questions. So I think I maybe have like two minutes for questions or something. Go ahead, Hyder. So when you say entitlements, are you doing design work or are you simply doing like density, like amount of like quantity of development can be changed? And like what, just define what entitlements are. In your so entitlements with single family residential means that I'm the one doing all the studies. Have, First of all, consultants do 95% of the lifting, mm -hmm. right? So we're doing all the studies. We're putting together the, all the land use applications. We're doing all the densities. We're doing everything. And we take it through the approval process. It's basically preliminary engineering work. We get it preliminary approved. Next step after that is we get our actual civil engineering construction drawings approved, OK? Uh -huh. But we're skipping that second step because the market's so hot. We're not even getting the construction drawings approved anymore, the actual civil engineering. Yeah. We're just getting the preliminary approval, which then locks that approval, locks that development in place. Okay, so, so you're not doing design, so you don't have to get DR Wharton involved for, for that piece. Well, with single family residential, because you're platting a project, vertical design has nothing to do with the approval process. No, no, no civil design, so like water flow and... Yeah, we're doing all that in the preliminary. Okay. Yeah. So are you getting that, so are you, 
is your group making that decision on what the design is with the buyer in, in mind? Or in hand? Yeah, so good question. So we, we will involve some of our buyers. At the end of the day, we're going to close on the deal with or without a buyer, right? So we run our deals as if clear through if we were going to build the houses because I got to know the deal works. So if I want to, if I got to take it all the way through home building, I will. But we do involve our guys often because we want to design it specifically for what they want at that time in that market. Um, but if they want to do something off the wall, because I know what's kind of industry standard and what's not, if they want to do something crazy, I won't do it because I'm not going to pigeonhole myself like that. Do you partner with people like us to actually do the full development? Because I'm one of those idiots that wants to build 200 houses to rent. Yeah. Um, to answer your question, it so would... Like if, if I brought you the land, could you help underwrite the deal and let me know if that's uh, something prob probable and then partner with you on it? Yes. Yes. So right now, so we generate a shit ton of ordinary income, Okay. What we're doing now through our fund, because now we have fees coming in for the first time ever. I've never had fees. I've always had to capitalize the company. Is we're now investing in passive deals, right? Because I'm not going to get outside my lane. I tried to go get outside my lane. It's not worth it, right? So I'm just staying in my lane. I'm an entitlement guy. That's what I do. And so I'm starting to invest capital passively. The reason I'm sharing that right now is because I think you need both. Well, by the way, I think you need a passive model and an ordinary income model. I think one alone doesn't work. But to answer your question, we're now doing that with guys as a way to create passive income for ourselves because I would want a piece of the holding. Yeah. I wouldn't need to make any money along the way. I just want a piece of the real estate that you're holding. Do you, are you able to share some of your uh, sources later? If you're going to Canton, I'll talk to you. It's yeah. Just, it's just uh, your financing and how that all works. Yeah. I, I want to learn about it so I, I know what questions to ask along the way. Sure. Probably, yeah, sure. What's your average engineering cost? Good question. It varies disgustingly, right? So I have some areas of the country where it costs me just to get through the, because just to get through that preliminary approval, the land use approval, not including CDs, construction drawing approval. So I spend somewhere between a thousand a lot to seven thousand a lot, depending on the area of the country. So everybody understands the model, right? Go ahead. Well, I have a question about the legacy piece. So when you were talking about keeping the legacy in the family of multi-generational farmland or whatever the hell it was, like, is there some tie to it where like, your name in the streets after the family? Or, like, what, what ties that they infuse to the legacy besides you're not? Phenomenal question, family? right? So the big legacy piece is that I'm not going to feel good about ripping some farmer's property from them when I know it's a big part of their legacy. Okay, this is a big transaction for them. And so, but it, it's a phenomenal question. We teach all of our people, negotiation 101 is figure out the hot buttons, right? Figure out the hot buttons. Before you get into price and terms, figure out the hot buttons. What's important to them? Often we're naming projects after their family or we're naming streets after their family. I got it, last year, I got a million price reduction on a deal last minute because the city threw me a curveball because, and in return, I named the subdivision after them. So everybody, go ahead. One more. No, I mean, I, I control the dirt, so I control the deal. And then last question on that. Um, you know, it looks like you were wholesaling kind of these things. Are you explaining that to the family? Hey, you're gonna, you're, we're going to go through this whole thing together? Because remember, you're using DR Horton to pay your... No, I'm not. I hate being called a wholesaler, just to be frank. Um, I'm in the value Although add business. Although that's what he fucking is, by the way. Right. right. I, 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 I'm in the value add business, right? So, because I capitalize all those approvals, right? That's so what my, makes it different. Right. So my average deal, I put a half a million dollars into. But you're, you're still under contract with the seller. Yeah. And I do a double closing, simultaneous close. Yeah. No, but I'm doing a, I don't know, I don't even know how wholesalers work. He's a hoteller. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's it. But let's be clear. One thing that is really cool about this, right, that, that when we were talking about this in my office, he's taking down the project, and he's taking it through the land entitlement process, which could take 18 months, two years, whatever. But he's not actually closing on the land until he... So the cost is associated with getting the property, bringing it up to value. 
But at that closing table, effectively that double closing is happening right there. And by the way, guys, it's millions of dollars. These are not $20,000 or a million dollar wholesale fee. These are $5 million wholesale fees, right? Yeah. This is not fucking around money. This is big time what's going on here. You so, tee a deal up for us, you get 10% of the profit. If you get the contract ink and you know how to ink it, you know how to price it and structure it correctly, we give you 15% of the profit. So to give you an idea, that student that's making 551,000, you can do the math and figure out what I'm making. Right? That's a five and a half million dollar deal that he's giving away $550,000 on. Um, I'm gonna, in that deal, including my fees along the way, um, my, my cost into that particular deal, which is, by the way, taken out before giving you that profit number, but I'll have, including the fees, the fund will put about 600 grand into that deal. So and my fees are like, my fees are like, a, like 150,000 on that deal or something. I highly encourage you guys to spend some time with Cody because I think there's something here for a lot of you. I think there's a lot of you that in the course of what you're doing day to day, a quick pivot here or there, we have the capabilities of doing it inside of SMART, what he was talking about on the title, uh, working with the title companies, you can do that directly inside of SMART. A quick pivot here or there and being able to partner with somebody that can create those types of paydays is worth considering. Would we not all agree? Yes? Yeah. All right. Cody, great job, brother. Thanks, Beth. <laughs>